Good morning, everybody. Um, today we are going to, let's say, start speaking about um, I would say multimodal interaction that will be the goal of next week. But before speaking of um, multimodal, multimodality in, in particular, um, let's start with, with this, that is designing for diversity. Uh, that as, as we see, we mean different things uh, actually. Um, and so in this part of the course, we are going to see different perspective uh, with respect to what we have seen up to now. So we, for up to now we have followed the process basically and for building graphical user interface. Starting from today, we are starting to open a little bit to non-graphical user interface or not only graphical user interface. Mm? So including other things in our interface or building user interface without the graphical part. Mm? So other perspective, other ideas, other things to consider in addition to, let's say, traditional graphical user interface, that is what we have focused on until now. So this is um, something in the middle, and after this part, we will go back again on the uh, evaluation with usability testing and controlled experiment that will be the last topic of the course. But again, today, designing for diversity. So just a short recap of what we should know until now. So until now, we know that it's important to design for the user and to follow a human-centered process. We started from need finding and go on from that way. Hmm? And we also know, let's say, that people are a mess, that people are complex, that uh, they are really different one from another, not only in different target population, but also in general because they can have different abilities, different weaknesses, different perspective of things. Mm? Uh, some maybe are more similar to the things that you thought, uh, that you think and that you, you feel, but other could be different. And especially, they come from different background and cultures. Mm? So something that is totally normal, let's expect in for, let's say, an Italian, it could be totally strange and unexpected for a non-Italian person. Mm? Uh, because the background, the culture, the way in which different people live and, and grow up mm, brings different assumptions among things. Mm? Something that for me could be totally normal and understandable and reasonable and without maybe specifying why I'm going to do something for another culture would be totally different, totally strange because they are used to do something in a different way. Uh, they could have a different interest, viewpoint and experience, hmm? not only across culture, across the world, but also within a same area, a same region. Hmm? And surely they could be people, could be of different ages and size. Hmm? We have already think about it with the need finding, mm, uh, when we thought, okay, we are going to target children, students, high school students, university students, uh, adult, the elderly, mm, and all these, let's say, category type of peoples are clearly different age, uh, different interests, different background, different experience, different capability, what they can do, different abilities, what they can do, what they can understand, if you, go, if, you, if you do a user interface for a child, it will need to have something totally different from a user interface for a 20 years old person. Mm, because the, the understanding of things is clearly different and the abilities they have is totally very different. And also the use they, they need to have for a user interface is clearly different. Uh, so all of this is clearly something that we all considered, for instance, the need finding phase, but it's not something that we should forget when we develop mm, and create a user interface. Uh, because maybe our user interface is for 
a certain population, as in your case, for a specific population, but within that population, differences could exist, but also that user interface could also be used by people outside your population. Mm? So if you do something, uh, let's say deploy something in, in the world, you could say, yes, this is for university students, but then you have a uh, 60 years old that is starting university uh, at that, that age uh, for getting new knowledge, for getting a degree, for any reason, and so y your interface that was fought for 20 years old immediately should be usable at least in a decent way, maybe not in a great way, but at least in a decent way, even for that person, for that is a person that you didn't plan for, because you didn't maybe imagine that case, that possibility. Hmm? Uh, so this is just the background of what we are basically going to speak today. And what do we typically do? So this is something that let's assume it is as a starting point. What we typically do is designing for people like us. Hmm? So maybe we think about other ages or yes, mainly other ages or other occupation, maybe job occupation or other background, mm, let's say more knowledge experiences. But typically we are, we imagine people like us. Hmm? So we start from us as a starting point for the design, but also for the creation of user interface. And this is normal, this is automatic for everybody. Mm? Uh, and this is as advantages and disadvantages. Clearly, it makes things totally easy for people like us, mm? but really difficult for everyone else. Mm? And and this as a consequence in a bigger scheme is that we end up with systems, with interactive systems that are designed mm, for people like us. So specific gender, maybe. Mm. There are projects that analyze software from a gender perspective mm, to see if they are too male oriented, for instance. And typically, yes, they are. Mm. Because most of developers are male and don't think about people different from their, their own. While writing languages, for instance, Brit text in the, in the user interface. A age, hmm? language ability. Hmm? Are we writing, doing a user interface, let's say in Italian, since most of you are Italian native speaker, uh, for other Italian native speaker? Or is you, our user interface good to use also for people that are learning Italian? that are not native Italian speaker or expert Italian speaker. And this is not, for instance, language a big, if we think about Western languages, Italian or English, let's say, it's not a big deal for a user interface in general on the overall design because maybe it involves where you put text, where you, wo where, when, where you put words, menus, buttons, etc. It's not the layout or the wall uh, navigation flow. More specific things to, to fix, but yet it could impact the usability and the usage in the end of an interactive system. The, the way in which you present things in written text, for instance, or the choice to have or not having an image to support the text. Uh, tech literacy. If we imagine everybody like us, we probably need a certain tech literacy in our user interface. But also physical ability. We are in this moment designing a user interface, graphical user interface, mm, that can only be used graphically. And if I'm blind, I cannot use that. Mm. So we are designing for people, also in this moment, like us. Uh, in some cases, it could, could also mean specific access to money or specific access to time. Mm? Uh, maybe not in our case, but in more, more general, it could be requirements for money to access to a specific service, to a specific system, or also time. You need to spend one hour to configure that things 
or to watch the things or to do something on the system, to, to have your task done hmm? when maybe you have half an hour now and half an hour, five hours later. But the process, the system is not able to interrupt the session in the middle, but needs you to dedicate one hour entirely in one moment. Hmm? So this is the, the starting point uh, that we have, and so the idea is that we should try to design not for people like us, but to try to consider different perspective. And when I say different perspective, typically the first thing that somebody thinks is disabilities. Hmm? So uh, I, I said before, uh, you're doing a graphic user interface, what if I am blind? But blindness is, is clear a disability. So, uh, as is pictured here, um, as you can see, we don't really have to consider only disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, clearly the interaction with design, with, the, the, with technology, depends heavily on what we can understand and remember. So, cognitive factors, see, hear, say, and touch. Mm -hmm. So, more sensory factor, motor factors. And we typically assume that everything, all, all of these work, and all of, all of these work greatly without a problem. So we are able to fully understand everything, we're fully to remember what happens three screens before, and we are able to hear, say, uh, see, and touch our user interface. It's a, it's a mobile application. Hmm? So we can do everything. We can see, we can read, we can understand, we can listen to the sound, we can touch the screen, uh, or click the mouse, uh, button on the mouse to, to do something. And we can speak maybe with, with the user interface. So we assume that full range of capability are always possible. Hmm? Uh, but again, this means ignoring several people. Uh, again, not only people with disabilities here in the first column. Hmm? This one but also the other two columns. Because we can have temporal, temporary, let's say disability, temporary impediment, or situational, contextual impediments. So let's imagine that we need uh, to create a, a, a graphical user interface, right? As, as we did. It's a web user interface. So we assume that everybody's seeing and we can ask, what if I am blind? And, and you can say, okay, there are tools for blind people. They are used to these tools. They can use that. But, and this is a permanent disability. Hmm? So these people are hi highly knowledge how to use technology because they maybe are blind since the, the, the beginning of their life. But then there is temporary situation. What if I, am the I have the cataract? I cannot see in that moment, but maybe in one week I will start to see again because I have an operation. Hmm? So are we excluding blind, but also we are excluding people with some other temporary disease for in that moment? And also we have a situational if we rely, if we have a user interface that strongly relies on vision, and only on vision, if, I, if the user interface is in a car, and I'm the driver, and I'm clearly distracted with respect to the user interface because I should focus on driving the car, I'm doing a disservice to that, that user if the user, the user interface is clearly something that you, you need to use in the car. Because the visual capability of a driver is occupied in doing other things than not looking at your user interface. Mm? So not only mm, the target population and people, kind of types of people as we call it, are important, but also the context in which the user interface is used is fundamental. Mm? So I mean, the user interface per se is perfect when used 
on a desk in a quiet place, but becomes terrible when it's used in a car. This very same user interface. Or we, we already probably thought, um, think, spoken about this in uh, for your project, but um, again, a mobile application used in a lab here, it's way different than using the very same user application uh, in the street, under the rain, mm, with an umbrella open. You, you have different things to focus on. You have different things to concentrate. Mm. And this happens for all the senses. Mm. Not only the senses, but also the cognitive capability. Mm. Maybe I have cognitive problems, permanent or temporary, this month. But maybe I have that task to be done because it's a work-related task or because it's something that I need to do for completing, to, for fulfilling some goals, for living, maybe. And I can also have a situational hmm, cognitive problem. Uh, let's make an, another example. Uh, uh, speak and hear. So which, uh, so let's, let's take a look at the, I don't know, Siri uh, or Google Assistant, uh, those conversational agents that are on, on the phones and are on most of your computer. Um, so clearly they are vocally only, or let's assume that for a moment, and they are clearly problematic for deaf people and nonverbal people. Nonverbal people are people that cannot speak, essentially, at various degree. Uh, so the temporary situation, again, could be uh, understandable. I have a ear infection, so I cannot listen very well. Or I have laryngitis, so I cannot speak very well. But it's temporary, then I can get some medicine and, and solve that. Situational events. When uh, things like um, Google Assistant on your phone cannot be used in a situational context. And this is a question for you. Or other option, they're not the bartender and the TV accent. In this room, hopefully, <laughs> you don't want to start that during a lecture or during a movie in a cinema or a play in a theater. You don't want to start speaking with a phone loudly, um, typically. Or maybe you want, but that's for another reason. Um, Another place, another situation. When there is too much noise in the room, like in a bar, like in a, um, uh, in some, some, some place where there is some music in a concert. Hmm? Maybe it's not a problem if you generate more noise, because there is already noise, but you cannot use that because there is too much noise for this the microphone to get your signal, your voice, and to hear back the answer. You maybe need some uh, earphone to hear, but speaking, if there is too much noise, it could be complex. So if we rely only on a few of these senses and capabilities of the human, we are losing opportunities for having our system working. So clearly, again, if we are thinking about uh, desktop application for the office, it's, it's way easier because uh, maybe hearing, speaking is not uh, a lot of a problem and also uh, there is no movement because people are in the place, so we have a limited set of people that we are excluding. But the point is we typically exclude some kind of people in designing, in general, a user application. Mm? If you think well, you can probably also relate to your project. So what we are going to, to cover today are basically two things. Uh, two, uh, a series, let's say two methodologies with their own principle. And again, these are principle, like the one that we, we discuss in general, but principle related to design for diversity specifically and linked to two specific methodology that are complementary, different, but not the same, and also some guidelines on a part of this. So again, principles are more uh, generic, 
and mm, cannot be immediately applied like a checklist as a guideline. So the first methodology that we are going to see that should help uh, a designer, a creator of a system, to reflect and to include more people, to consider all that uh, contextual, temporary, and permanent situation is inclusive design. Mm. So inclusive design is the definition in the first line, is a methodology that enables and draw on the full range of human diversity, mm, including and learning from people with a range of perspectives. Mm. So it's an approach that try not to check whether your solution is compliant with something, mm, with including everybody, but, uh, but it's a solution, it's, it's a methodology that uh, try to have you build or include in your solution, in your artifacts, in your system, one person, one, let's say, capability, one perspective at a time. Mm -hmm. So it's a one size fits one approach, mm -hmm. and not a one size fits all, differently from the universal design. And what it means that is one size fits one. That means that it's designing a system or a portion of a system. Mm? Not, not maybe not, it's not the entire system, just a piece of it. For a very specific use case, and then extending this to other. So pick, in a sense, pick one of these. Mm? Let's say. Let's focus on blind people. Mm? So how can we modify? our system, our user interface, so that it's usable, not in a decent way, but is greatly usable for a person who is blind. And then for that, from that, start to say, okay, how this change that we made specifically for blind people can be extended to the others? How can they benefit people that are not blind permanently? maybe temporary, maybe contextual, or maybe not even blind, but it's something that it could benefit also other people automatically. Mm? And, and the idea is that start from the hardest case and extend it to others. Mm? Uh, so inclusive design, the idea of inclusive design is including mm, a portion, it's modifying, creating, revising a portion or, or the system, or the entire system, so that uh, we can include, we can implement a specific use case and then extend that use case. Mm? So in this sense, is a one size fits one, because we are taking one system, a piece of one system, whatever, and working towards a specific use case. Not making the system usable for everybody in the world with every capabilities, etc. But just let's take a pick a problem and try to fix that specific problem. And then uh, let's uh, redo that for another problem. Mm. Maybe over time, even when the system is maybe uh, deployed, mm, this can be done. So th here there is a warning in the slides that say there is no standard shared defini definition of inclusive design in terms of practices and, uh, and principle, what we are relying here, especially for the principle, are for uh, are the definition that Microsoft design, mm, that is the portion of Microsoft that is focused on designing, uh, is doing about inclusive design. Mm. If you look at inclusive design in the web, you will find probably other definition, other principle, but more or less they go here as an idea. In general, then some details could, could change. Maybe some principle will be slightly different. So which are the three principles of inclusive design according to Microsoft Design uh, that is actually they are really well done um, and more understandable? Uh, these are these three. Recognize exclusion, learn from diversity, and solve for one, extend to many. Mm -hmm. So the first one is telling you as creator of a system, recognizing that you are excluding someone. Start from that consideration. 
you are excluding some people from your user interface, from your system. Hmm? So starting from that consideration, ask yourself who are, uh, am I excluding? So examining what you are building mm, and recognizing who would be excluding from fully using it. Maybe not for the entire system, maybe not for the entire user application, maybe not for all the features, but maybe just one feature is excluding somebody. And say who I'm excluding. Mm. And also consider, always remember, that exclusion happens when we don't pay attention to our own biases. We assume that everybody will fully understand Italian, so we write a, a user interface in Italian, except not. Hmm? Uh, also, the other ideas about disabilities, temporary, situational, focuses on senses, hear, smell, uh, see, ex speak, etc., but also cognitive, hmm? could be cognitive difficulties in understanding something. So ask, your, ask yourself, who are we excluding? Considering this, hmm, or considering your biases, or consider your assumption that you are making, that you have, because all we have assumption, and you are not either spelling out clearly, openly, and Im embedding that assumption in your user interface. Again, these are principles, so they are general, uh, like the other principle, not very a checklist, let's say, oh, let's check if the button is, that word in the button is, is good, or all the words are understandable by everybody, etc. Hmm? This clearly starts within your target population and then could be extended a bit outside, but also within the target population, there could be some people that is excluded. Hmm? And we will see an example, we will do a, uh, an exercise, let's say here, five minutes, about uh, a solution hmm, for including more people in a specific context. Um, because again, let me say it again, inclusive design, this way at least, is focused on building a solution hmm, more than everything else. The second is, the second principle is learn from diversity. So put people at the center of the design process from day zero. This is same old, same old. We already know that. But try to imagine how a person with a given set of abilities would use a system, would use your system or a similar system, or a system that is similar to yours. Hmm? So we did a, a little bit this when we asked you to say, to think about extreme stakeholder in the need finding state, the phase or for the, yeah, in the need finding phase. But this is saying, don't forget those extreme stakeholders. Don't forget people in the latter stages. So it's not just something for need finding and then I can forget and I focus on more technical parts, but don't forget people even in the other steps of the process. Um, and we can either imagine how a person with a given set of abilities, cognitive, physical, et cetera, again, contextual, hmm, would use a system, our system, and maybe if it's not possible to imagine because it's hard, we can observe how a person can use, actually use a system that is similar to ours, that will be fulfill the same goal, a very similar goal, or has the same interaction modality that ours system. So observing, especially because it's not always possible imaging uh, the various context, again, situational, emotional, or mm, other kind of context. Mm. Because again, one thing that we didn't cover up to now, and we're briefly covering here, is that you are using, also now, you're using an application, you're using something on your computer in a specific context in a specific moment of your day and of your life. Maybe this morning you receive a great news and you are very happy and you're using that with that, let's say, happiness. Or maybe you receive a very terrible uh, news and you are not very happy and you are uh, listening to this lecture with this mood. And this impact, 
not only listen to the lecture, but also how you use the application. The, the level of frustration that you are uh, happy to support, hmm? maybe you, you are happy to say, okay, yes, I've seen this error 11 times, 12 is fine. Or maybe say, no, I've seen this error 11 times, I'm going to uninstall this application and because it's too much. Hmm? So also this could impact how you use the application. And it, clearly it's difficult to imagine all of these hmm? because life happens and and we, we, we cannot really imagine all the situation, but we can at least try when possible. Mm -hmm. And then the third principle is uh, solve for one, extend to many, that is the core idea of this inclusive design. Start from one specific edge use case and then try to extend to other and see how other would benefit about this. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, basically what Microsoft called the beauty of a constraint. Mm? So Microsoft say, especially for the third things, but not, not only for the entire process, but especially for the third principle, start from the most complex cases. Start from the most constrained uh, situation. So like design for people with permanent disabilities. That is a significant constraint, right? I'm doing a system for a person that cannot use a keyboard and a mouse or a touch screen. They cannot physically use a keyboard and a mouse uh, or a touch screen. It does, doesn't have the physical ability to, to touch a screen or to move a mouse with the, need, the, the precision that we need for. How can we design a, a system, an application, a graphical application for, for that, that person? That would be difficult, way more difficult than saying uh, I would design a a graphic user application for a person that is not using very well the mouse and the keyboard for five minutes per day. Hmm? But say, if you start from the edge case, hmm, the resulting design can benefit more people. Hmm? Uh, and we have a lot of these examples in our world, in the things that we use and we, and, and we know that we are currently using, maybe not in this moment, but we're using. So let's take an example for a person that is hard of hearing, hmm? um, so he's not able to listen. Which example of things that you experienced could be, could have been done for that person, but maybe you already uh, used that? Don't look at the next slide because there is a solution. Try to, to think about that. Subtitles, Subtitles captions, in videos. Mm? They were designed, created for people that cannot listen, but you can use that, that in a crowded place. Even if you are normally able to, to listen, if you are in a crowded place, very noisy, you can watch a video, or you cannot, like here, if you're watching a video on YouTube, uh, please remove the audio and watch the video with the captions. Mm -hmm. You can. You are not dis creating difficulties to everybody, and it's something that the video is enabling you to do. And that is something that specifically was created for people that cannot hear well, but has an impact on everybody else Life. Another example. At least one, then we can move on. Sketches or images? Sir? And it's, I don't get it. Ah, okay, you are uh, totally vocally dialogue and you can have a visual representation of the dialogue. Yes, and that's similar to caption in another level of, of another context, clearly. Uh, the other? Gestures. Gestures. Yes, and language is 
clearly not something that we can use a lot. Uh, it, it's a language per se that you can learn, but it's not something that you, you benefit directly. Vibration could be, yeah. But you can also have, um, uh, well, not for uh, people of hard of hearing, but automatic door openers. The door that opens automatically is, was th it was something that was created for people with mobility impairments, but clearly are an advantage for everybody, not having to open a door. It's not something to say, oh yes, there is an open door, an automatic door, and a normal door, I will go to the normal door. Everybody will go to the, the automatic door. Mm? And not for laziness also, but also if you have contextual impairments. If you have, um, if you're going grocery so shopping and you have your hands full of bags of stuff that you, you, you are carrying on, why should I stop and open the door when I have an automatic door? It's easy, it's also benefit me. Mm? Because in that moment, I have a contextual impairment in my mobility because I have uh, doing grocery shopping. I have, I have a child that I'm carrying on, so I have um, carrying on this, 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 this child, so I have uh, my hand busy, or I broke my leg, and for that moment, temporary situation, I have difficulties in, or broke my arm, I have difficulties in, um, in moving. Hmm? So an automatic door is actually good for also for me. Or audiobooks. Audiobooks, similar to, to say, that one, were created for people uh, who cannot see, so blind people. But then you can buy them and use them mm, while on the go. And, and also if you can read and, and, and buy a, a physical book to, to read, so if you can see. Mm, and, and then, Again, not only for leisure, but audiobooks could be, for instance, useful for learning a new language, the pronunciation, because maybe you, book a, you, you buy an audiobook in English and you see an English speaker um, reading the book. So you are learning mm, the, the language uh, as well. So it, again, something that was created for specific edge case and then it's useful for a lot of other people. So let's try to quickly, a couple of minutes, um, try to apply this inclusive design in a specific case that is more similar to a software world in which we are, we are and we are focusing on. So you uh, are creating a video game, new task, creating a video game for console, not for computer, for console, Xbox, PlayStation, Pick one, we don't care. But you uh, have a new task for, for now that is creating a video game. And this video game cannot be any video game that you like, but it has a rule. It should be a competitive game, so not a simulation game, hmm? but a competitive game in which a character uh, needs to jump, run, maybe drive, so they should do this kind of action, not solving puzzles, hmm? not looking for stuff around with calm, but an action game in which you have to run, and if you run faster, and you complete a mission running faster than another person, you won, or you get more points than another. Hmm? So you want to create that for general population because it's a video game, say teenagers or young adults, hmm? maybe if you want a more specific target population. And again, for console, competitive with this kind of action to be done. Hmm? So, the question that I will leave you a couple of minutes to think, also if you want to speak in small groups, is fine, is in creating this video game that you could also have, you could all have some experience of this kind of games in mind at least, is who are you excluding? Start from edge cases, but not only, but then extending a bit outside the edge cases, and ideally, which of them people, which of these people can you observe and how? Hmm? And try to imagine a couple of solutions, at least one, maybe two, solution to 
include the people that you imagine here playing well this competitive game for console that you are creating, that you have maybe are already created. You already have uh, jumping, running, driving, whatever, competitive video game done. You're ready to, to deploy in the market for, let's say, the Xbox or, again, the PlayStation, and you are asking yourself, who are we excluding with this game and which solution can we employ for overcoming this exclusion? Think about it, a few, a few minutes. You can also speak if you want. And clearly don't look at the rest of the slides because there is a possible solution for that, so. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if you haven't finished everything, but uh, let's start from who are you excluding? Uh, two or three answer at least. 
you were speaking, so. Okay, so let me uh, summarize that for the recording. So the first, you identify three uh, types of, say, of people that you are excluding. The first one uh, could be more general uh, because people with limited mobility, um, and you exemplified for arthritis, but also other kind of mobility issues, clearly, uh, so that they cannot use with the hands the, 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 the controller. Uh, and you say, okay, for this kind of people, we are going to do, a, how do you call it? a trackpad on the floor that could be used by the feet, using feet. So they can use the trackpad, but just jumping in on the buttons, essentially. Uh, and this, again, solve a specific edge case, people with limited mobility, but could be extended from people with temporary contextual situation. Clearly, you need, you need to have space. Hmm? Um, and this is good, because it's actually in line with in inclusive design, because it's something that you can, you add, you change for including more people. People that don't have this kind of issues can continue to use the controller and the game as is. Uh, the second one was color blindness. Um, that is less gener generalizable than the first one because it's just color blindness. Uh, and there is a lot of different type of color blindness actually. Uh, and the solution for that could be, well, th that could be, that could be probably choosing wisely the color for everybody. And so that this is not really, this is more, as we will see in a minute, it's more universal design and not inclusive design because you're making a change that everybody could benefit for. More like automatic door. Mm? Different from the first one for which you have something separate for solving the problem, the, the feet-based trackpad. And the third one was people with epilepsy. People with epilepsy. And the solution Ah, well, again, the solution could be don't put too much flashlight or have an option to disable flashlight lighting before starting the game so that you can have both versions of the game, one for people that have this kind of um, sensibility, let's say, that can trigger epilepsy from watching, playing the game, and for everybody else, just is a flip, something to flip and to enable disable uh, flipping light. The third one, again, is more in line with inclusive design than not for this or the second. But great answer, all the three. Yeah. You have time for four or ten people already there uh, for the specific type or the problems. Uh, or if you have uh, uh, chats or uh, uh, people in front of the other, uh, I'd like to come in for some time and why do they focus on the problem of the uh, screen. And that you can be used for your project to the Okay, so uh, basically uh, people who have difficulties uh, in vision, different difficulties, trying to make the video game more um, highlighting the, the important part of the game, the portion of the game, so that they can focus on the task at hand and not on the, the noise and the, contra in the, the contour of the game, mm, of what is on the screen, right? Uh, also, this could probably be a, a switch that say, okay, focus mode on uh, or focus mode off, something like that. Yeah. Another one, maybe, yeah. Uh, for people and people who are not able to see, maybe uh, the early intervention uh, is greater than the disability of the following Okay, so this is more for children or people that cannot read actually, not only children. Uh, illiteracy is, is still present in the world, uh, maybe not, not a lot in Italy, but in the world it's still present. 
Um, so having uh, other way to present, to convey written text, maybe with vibration or with other kind of uh, pictorial, let's say, representation, right? Something like this. Okay, no, good answer. Um, <clears throat> and it's fine because what I'm going to present to you is something that you didn't think about because none of you, I would say, think about this word. It was in bold for a reason, actually. Because all of your solution doesn't impact the competition of the game. A little bit the one with the, the fit-based trackpad. But again, it could be challenging, but should be something similar. Uh, the other focus more on the game per se. There could be a simulation game or a jump running game. Doesn't really change for the current blindness for the other option. Mm? Um, so uh, all of these, uh, and then let's move a little bit from competition. Uh, all of these in a competitive way will require, and this is something that you probably already understood, fine motor skill to compete because you need to press a button quickly, or you need to do action quickly, otherwise you're losing time or uh, points or whatever. Hmm? So this quick is, is also important for competition, not for completing the game alone, hmm, clearly. So you have, some of you consider limited mobility, it's fine, but also, as an edge case, also uh, it could be uh, a solution, could be about limited mobility could be for people who never played a video game before or that specific video game before. So they're learning, they need to, to have a mentor, let's say, that show them how to win in that game, not to play and uh, be the last one in the, in the competition, but maybe to, to be on the top 10 people in the competition because this is a competitive video game, right? So a solution, a possible solution, in addition to what you, you have proposed, but more focusing on this competition part, is what if we introduce a co-pilot mode? So we can have two game controllers work together so that people can control the same charter or car or whatever needs to be controlled. Uh, and this could help people with limited um, mobility, because you have the other players that can jump in and help this person to, they are doing teamwork, but with one charter, basically. And also, for instance, you can include a novice player, because you can have a mentor that can show how to do things, maybe one time, and then the novice player could do that the next time, but the mentor is still there, ready to, to help and to solve the problem. Hmm? And so this opens gaming for your competitive game, if you can obviously manipulate also the, the console, adding a double controller or adding the feet based trackpad that they were proposing before to people with disabilities, temporary injuries, novice gamers, kids, hmm? because maybe something is very fast paced and a kid cannot really uh, stay. Um, but also people that just want to play together I don't want to compete with you in the game with my charter versus his charter, but we want to play together and see if, we, if our combined strength will produce a better result than me alone or he alone. Maybe yes, maybe not. We can just play together in the same room or in the same place. So this could be another solution. Hmm? Um, that has advantages, disadvantages like yours, actually. And this is, was actually a real solution that Microsoft came up with the Xbox One, applying this universal design process like you briefly did uh, in the uh, now, basically. And this was called actually co-pilot mode and is actually in the Xbox One, not for just one competitive game that you are creating, but for the entire console. So it enables to use two controllers in this way to say, okay, like in a plane, at a certain point, I can have a co-pilot. And we, okay, we can drive, let's say, play together. I can play and the other person can assist. The other person can play and I can assist. The other person can play alone and I'm watching. Different level, like a co-pilot, a real co-pilot. And this was actually done 
applying the, those three principles, starting asking who are we excluding with the Xbox One playing game and moving forward. Mm. So this is something that if you have an Xbox One, you can turn on and off copilot if you have two controllers. Uh, clearly, this doesn't solve per se the problem with limited mobility because if you, again, have a um, problem in pressing quickly this button, still you have this problem because the controller is, is what it is. It's small, it has buttons, so you, you don't have the, uh, sorry, again, the feet based trackpad because you, that doesn't solve the problem. But again, Microsoft, this is not an advertise for Microsoft, but just recognizing that in this case they did an uh, outstanding job in applying the, the principle that they refined actually. Um, not only with scope mode, but Microsoft take another look at the problem uh, and create another solution, not only for this problem of gaming, but an other, other kind of problem, and came up with asking yourself, who are we excluding? And again, you could say people with limited mobility that cannot use these, they cannot press buttons, they need to use feet or something like, something like this, and they came up with these. And that is clearly, you can buy that in addition to an Xbox if you want, and it's called the adaptive controller. And it's basically this thing here that has more or less the same button than the controller, but it's bigger, a little bit bigger, and that has a button that are clearly easier to press. So if you cannot press buttons and keep the controller on in your hand for a while, you can have this on the table, and so maybe you are more comfortable in using that. But they did something more. They said, okay, this is a good starting point. What if this is not only adaptive to the need, it is really adaptive to the needs. of The person that wants to play, and this could be used together with copilot mode, but also without copilot mode. So there are solutions to different problems that can be used together. What if here we make this thing expandable? So they put this jack here, uh, I think also this uh, sort of USB port here to add other accessory. Mm? So if you cannot use the three, this three button here or this, because again, you, you don't have this fine control to pressing this precisely or quickly. Maybe you can do with this big one, but not with this small. Well, you can, you, you have your own button, your own hardware, these are just button, switch button, pressed, not pressed, of different sizes. This is big one, this is smaller, uh, and other kind of accessories, especially for usability. Uh, but you can plug in in your controller and use the hardware that you need. So you, if you create a feed-based trackpad, you can make it compatible with Xbox if you are able to provide an interface through this jack basically. And you can use all the games on the Xbox with that. Mm -hmm. So again, not to advertise Xbox uh, or accessories, but to say that in this case, uh, this is a good application of that inclusive design. They're solving one problem at a time, asking themselves, who are we excluding? And what we can learn, clearly this was also about learning problems, observing people playing, with games, with the Xbox, to understand which are the, the issues, uh, observing the same kind of observation that you did, just focused in later in, in the process because they already have the Xbox on the market. They already have games. They already have controllers hmm, in the world, in the market, so they cannot say, okay, let's throw everything away and start from scratch. Hmm? So something that you can, you can edit and add to include more. Hmm? So this is another very good example of this. Uh, so clearly all of this is similar, is, this is just a note, is something that we, we speak about, we spoke about people with disabilities, permanent, temporary, etc. So we are speaking about accessibility of the system with inclusive design, yes and no. Mm. The distinction is that accessibility is one attribute, it's a property, it's more, it could be more on the side of guidelines, while inclusive design is a method. 
and as principle for it, mm? so different level. And accessibility, in contrast to inclusive design, focus more on people with disabilities, on blind people, and ensure that there are no barrier to serve those specific people. And with a series of check, I, I, did I do this, yes or no? Is my web application usable with a screen reader? Yes, no. Are my images, let's speak about the web. Are my images, have, all my images have an alternative text representing the textual, the, the content of the image in a textual way? Yes, no. And if the answer is no, you have to fix it. Is my colors in my website, in my game, compliant for blind people, for, well, not blind people, clearly, with uh, color blindness people, or with other kind of uh, difficulties in vision. Mm -hmm. There is not just blind and color blindness, there could be a, a also different level of blindness and um, diseases. Mm -hmm. Maybe you cannot uh, see in the periphery, you see only black and white, there are a lot of range of these. Mm -hmm. So they have, Testable, checklist, do that, do that, for web, not for the web, in general. Mm? While inclusive design is a, a step above all of this. Mm? As a result of inclusive design, you will probably have products and services and user interface more accessible, but is not ensuring that your product is accessible. Mm? There is something different. You include more people, but maybe don't met all the needs, the specific needs of that specific type of people that you are considering. So they can work together because they are a different level, but one is the method, another one is more a uh, checklist mm, based approach for ensuring technical and uh, practical sustainability for, access, for accessing, having all the people accessing the same instrument in a better way. The other methodology that we are going to see quicker than the first one, actually, is universal design. Universal design is, as I said before, complementary, and it was more about the second idea that this small group uh, came up with in the video game, or, as I said before, automatic door openers. Uh, because the idea of universal design is designing systems that are usable by anyone, not asking yourself, who are you excluding? but saying, we are excluding a lot of people, let's include everybody. Mm? But not adding a new controller, a new option, but creating something that is from day zero, usable in the same way by everybody, like automatic doors. Mm? You don't need, you, are not, you, you can use automatic doors even if you don't have impairments for mobility. Mm? Is in this sense, a one size fits all. So inclusive design is one size fits one, because start from a specific issue, a specific case, and enlarge it. This is a one size fits all. Mm? That is not prone at all to consider edge cases, specific case, but try to make something for everybody. Mm? Uh, and more, most importantly, universal design was born in the physical world. While inclusive design starts from the digital world, Universal design start from the physical world. And universal design has seven principles that we are not going to see all the seven. And, and you see in this picture, they are always depicted with the physical world in mind. Because they started there. They, they can be applied to, to the digital world as well, but it starts from the physical world. And some of these principles are actually principles that we already know. Hmm? Look at principle number three simple and intuitive to use. Or principle number five, handling in a good way errors. There are no principles that we already know because they are generic principles. And other that are more maybe suitable for the physical world than not digital, size and space for approach and use. And so it's about size that could also impact graphical user interface because the size of button, the size of a screen could also have an impact, but it's, it's clearly born there in the physical world. So 
So this is one of, of the big difference. So the first difference with in inclusive design is this is really a one size fits all approach. So I'm not trying to consider edge cases, but try to do something from day one for everybody, not adding a controller. Mm? So adding a copilot mode and adding a controller to Xbox is not something that universal design would do. Universal design would replace the controller with something that everybody can use, not only the, the person with limited mobility, uh, but everybody. So a new controller for everybody. This is more in line with universal design. And hmm? so here, you know, these are the, the key points. The design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design, without the need to adding something or to specialize or to change option, but something that is really usable by everybody. And a clear example, the automatic door. It's something that you can use. It's not a different entrance. Or this kind of shish source here. Mm? You can use this, but also if you have some problem, you, you can still use the same shish source. You don't have two kind of shish source according to the, your abilities, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, size and space for approach and use. Mm? The same entrance to the metro, mm? hypothetically, that could be large enough, this is dedicated for people on a wheelchair, but you can use that if you want. Because it's the same thing, just slightly larger, but if you remove the, the picture on the, on the side, say this is reserved for, why not? Why cannot use that? So a better way for universal design is having all the entrance larger so that everybody can use that. So you don't have the, the reserve entrance from one, from people on the wheelchair and everybody else. Because again, if you have moving uh, um, a, a child, hmm, uh, carrying around a child, this could be also useful for, for, for a parent and the child. Then not this, where maybe the space is too limited. Hmm? So again, universal design is more about making something from day one um, useful for everybody. And this is an example of universal design. Why this is an example of universal design? What is this? You, uh, you, you see that around the city, uh, at every corner, almost every corner. What is this? Yeah, this is a ramp to, to reach, to, to go on the sidewalk. The sidewalk is all the, the, the marciapiede is the sidewalk. This is the ramp. Uh, and why this is universal design? Word for wheelchair, word for you, if you don't want to step, to do steps, bicycles, etc. And if you're blind, what you can touch? Not only, the lines. The lines are not the statics. The lines in the, in, the, in the sidewalk are for indicating the, that the sidewalk is moving in this direction and this is the end and there are some you know, entry points and you can touch with the, the cane and the cane can sense that there is hmm, this hmm, uh, way of proceeding and then after these that are smaller than the previous one, so if you want also you can uh, sense these, at the end of that there is the normal, let's say the, the plain, um, the horizontal sidewalk. So this is not only for mobility issues, but also for instance for blindness. Because this is a help for understanding that there is this thing and how it's done, this thing. How, how quickly go up. This is universal design, because it's not adding something specific for somebody, but it's something that you can use independently from, from your capabilities, for your abilities, for your situation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, here there is another example, if you want to look at it, there is a, is a video. Uh, but basically this, is, this was a graphics interface, partially universal, partially inclusive, 
uh, because it can be used with your eyes. You can look at the things and the things will open. So if you look here, if you look at the button here, the button will be clicked. And this is multimodal, uh, we will see next week, but also uh, universal actually, uh, because you can use that with also mouse, keyboard, and touch. This is also a touch screen. So you can really uh, use it in a, different, in a lot of way. It, it's a little bit more inclusive because this is, was designed specifically for people with ALS, hmm? uh, SLA in Italian. Uh, so people that cannot use at a certain point anything else than their eyes. But still they can control a user interface, in this case, uh, a smart home. Uh, but again, it could be also used for usable completely by everybody else with a mouse and uh, a touchpad because this is also a touch screen because uh, this is also touch. And if you want, there is a short video showing how this work uh, with eyes. These are the two methodologies, guidelines. For guidelines, let's speak a bit mm, these 10 minutes about accessibility and in particular accessibility in the web since we are doing prototypes uh, on the web and that nobody else in the uh, application, the web application one course is in Italian or in English is covering this topic. Uh, but it is strongly related to what we have seen clearly. Um, so what is accessibility in the web? Well, accessibility uh, briefly, I, I briefly defined before, but why should focus on the web independently from the content of this course? Because the web is still, uh, it's big. Uh, as great potential for a lot of things, and yet today in 2021, end of 2021, there are a good number of websites that can only be navigated with a mouse or a touch, more with a mouse. Um, so if you are blind, you cannot use that. That's it. You are not able to navigate a website if you are blind. A lot of websites are still in this situation in 2021. And only a very small percentage of videos and multimedia content on the web have been captioned. There is some automatic captioning, like on YouTube, but there is not only YouTube that exists. In some way, the automatic captioning is not really good. Uh, it's improving, but it's not really good. Um, and, and so there are issues. Again, still issues. And some of them are really trivial to be fixed by developers, really, really trivial. Also from users, the creator of web application, the content web application, or web uh, application. And accessibility on the web, clearly it's probably more exemplified for blind people because it's the other one can see the page, so it's half of the problem solved. Uh, but clearly encompass all disabilities for access to the web. Auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speculated, also again, situational or temporary. Hmm? Because again, you, you cannot see for now, you cannot access it the, to the website. Hmm? And clearly it relies on several components. Hmm? There are the actual web content that, that is the one that you see in the web page. There are also things that rely to user agents, how browser are built. Uh, and assistive technology that you can plug in on your computer, and also authoring tools, code editors, content manager system, how people add information to a website, the comments that you write under a post. This is not something that a developer can, can imagine before, because you are writing in that moment some content. You are putting an image. And so the system should be able to say, okay, you are putting an image, please add the alt text or non please add the alt text, the alternative text for this image, etc. And I said before, these are guidelines because they are more specific, a sort of a, a, a checklist, and there are quite a lot of guidelines on these three level, from the content creator to uh, the user agents, so browser, etc., to developers, uh, and all these guidelines are provided by the W3C, which has a web accessibility initiative that has all these guidelines for the various things. And these guidelines 
are also adopted in some laws, some national and international laws. For instance, in Italy, there is this Stanka Act and the modification that they did in time. I think that this Stanka Act is about 1996, but was modified several times to keep uh, play, to keep, to stay uh, in line with these web content accessibility guidelines. Hmm? So this is a law that every public administration should, in the original idea, must, but then become should apply for all the public website. So municipalities, universities, whatever is public should be totally accessible. Hmm? Accessible for the web content perspective. So these WCAG guidelines. And just to give you a, a brief overview of that, we are not going to, to see them in details, but they are guidelines, so you just need to check them. Uh, and guidelines like the image must have an alternative text if it's not um, just a, um, oh, it's called. Um, so if it's an image that brings content, it should have, uh, it must have uh, alternative text. If it's just f if there for aesthetics, like a banner, but without real meaning, just for, oh, it's nice to see that, but without meaning for the content on the page, it can be skipped, hmm? the alternative text. Um, but WCG is split in these four categories. They call it principle, but some more categories, about perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, spanning about visual, but not only, clearly, for the understandable. Then there are guidelines, text alternatives. So there is a guideline say all images should have text alternatives, all videos should have captions, et cetera, et cetera. Time-based media. Then a guideline about, a set of guidelines about adaptable, distinguished, about having a website totally accessible with a keyboard. So try to navigate one um, website without using the keyboard, without using the mouse. You should be able to. Hmm? So we, 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 we a lot of time brought the, the Polytechnic website as a bad example. But in this case, uh, if you go to didattica.polit.it, uh, they did a, a really great job for accessibility. So didattica.polit.it is very, very good for accessibility, from an accessibility perspective for the guidelines. Hmm? Really, really a, a lot usable, a, a lot very well done for that perspective. Hmm? Um, but we don't have time to, to look at it, but you, you, can, you can check uh, if you want yourself. And, and since these are guidelines, like a checklist, you can clearly apply it while building a website, but there are also tools to automatically check some of these guidelines. And so for instance, Google Chrome has uh, an extension, also Firefox, has an extension to check the accessibility website and it will give you uh, a ranking, a number, saying, okay, with respect to these guidelines here. And then colors are also here for color blindness. There is a guideline because it's something that you can standardize. Hmm? Contrast between text in the foreground, the text in the background. Hmm? It's something that you can standardize. You can check the contrast should be this different. And th this guideline are, can be split in three levels also. Level A, most of them are just a level A. Level A is either the standard or the minimum level. Hmm? That say most of the issues, if you fix that, 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 that guidelines with a level A, you fix most of the issue, but not all. Hmm? So for some, uh, like text alternative, you just have a level A. Because if you provide text alternative, you, you, you have done, there is not, nothing more that you can do except providing good text alternative. But this is up to, to the person, not something that the checklist can fix. The checklist can say, and also the automatic tools can say, you have to provide a good text alternative. And then the tool check if there is or not a text alternative. But if the text alternative is ABC, it's always ABC, there is a text alternative. Is useless, but there is. Level A, level triple, level double A, and level triple A are instead 
more strict level guidelines. Mm? Colors, for instance, with level A, colors are all three levels. With level A, you cover, let's say, probably 80%, let's say this number, I'm not sure if it's the correct number, but 80% eight, of the co color um, perception difficulties that a person can, ha can have. With level double A, maybe you reach 95%, and with level triple A, you reach maybe 100%. Clearly, with level AAA, you have a very limited set of colors that you can use in combination. While this set is basically complete, large, like without checking the, the guidelines, with level A, for which you have much more color to, to compensate upon this. And just to give you uh, a quick look, one minute, and then we can get leave. Uh, just let's use this because I said it was well done. So here, for instance, there is the in Lighthouse. If I didn't disable it, yes, there is the accessibility check for, let's say, desktop and Chrome, but same as Firefox, actually, can generate a, a score for you. Mm -hmm. So here the score is 57. Uh, so medium for this page, only for this page, and uh, there are mm, some rules like background and foreground co color that they have a sufficient contrast, not in general, but where here, mm, these uh, topics or people that is a gray that is too light with respect to the white in the background. This is easily just pick up stronger gray or put it black. Mm. So they're very, and, and this solve the guidelines because it's just very minimal. The page is okay. It's just that very small detail that doesn't fulfill um, a guideline. But according to this test, the guideline is not fulfilled because there is at least one. Hmm? Clearly, the guideline would not be fulfilled even if all the page has this problem. In this case, it's just very limited. So it's, it's good. It's easy to solve. One second change and you solve an entire guideline because all the rest of the page is I uh, know sorry it actually is better on the home page than not here this this number but uh, anyway and and then there are also the list of the checklist of the guideline that the website fulfill and uh, so so you have also reference and the guidelines that are not applicable because either cannot be applied automatically or because you need you need to check to them or because they don't apply here like for instance the the ones about video. There is no video here, so they are not applicable in this case. Hmm? But again, this is another level guidelines, easier, let's say easier to implement, just one thing that the developer and the creator, the, the content creator for the page should include hmm, in uh, when creating the, the website. And this is another way clearly for designing, more developing, but also for designing for actually more developing in this case, for diversity. Mm? Considering not only the methodology, but also the low level, let's say, checklist to, to include in, uh, in a web application or in a mobile application. There are some guidelines are similar with other standards, and there are also best practices for, for that. OK. So we are almost on time. So we can conclude here the, the lecture. Next week we will start, we will speak more about multimodal design, keeping in mind this discourse about diversity, and we will see in, we will meet in five minutes in the lab when you, we, you will have the, the, with the first group, when you will have the um, heuristic evaluation, so I hope that you are all prepared.